this presentation tonight is we'll talk about the type of volcano it is. It's a strata volcano. We'll, we'll examine the events leading up to the 1980 eruption. We'll see that big one and all its effects. And then we'll look at some post activity since 1980. And then we can speculate a little bit about the future of the volcano. Okay, so before 1980, Mount St. Helens was called the Mount Fujiyama of the U.S. because Mount Fuji is your perfect stratocone volcano. Notice the perfectly sloping sides. It's just shaped like a Hershey's Kiss. And, uh, and, and that told geologists that it was a young volcano because it hasn't eroded. So you had that perfect shape. Okay, it had the perfect symmetry and the shape of what we call a stratocone volcano, sometimes called a composite cone. You can see Mount Rainier in the background, or maybe that's not, uh, no, that's Rainier. I think we're now. Okay, uh, anyway, and Spirit Lake was America's playground. And so what we're going to do is we're going to recount the events that took place to change something like this into this in a matter of minutes. Okay, so first we have to learn what kind of volcano it is, okay? I know in 1980 I was a geologist, so I thought that all volcanoes just float lava like I saw in Hawaii. That is not the case. Uh, that is one type of volcano, the, the Hawaiian volcanoes, but this is a stratocone volcano. So uh, sometimes called composite cones, but they're made of layers of volcanic material. And this is repeated eruptions that builds this cone. So it shoots tephra, loose material, into the air, it falls in a pile, and then the lava comes and flows over it and caps it off and congeals it. And then more tephra and more lava, more tephra and more lava, and eventually it builds up to be the perfect cone that we see. Okay, it's made of layers. Now where is that material coming from? Well, that's materials coming from below the surface. So below every volcano, there is a magma chamber. And if, if it can find its way to the surface, it has to make use of cracks that are already there in the rock, and it moves upward. And then if it makes it to the surface, then you start having eruptions. Okay, so where is that stuff coming from? The magma chamber is way up here, but if we go down deeper to about 60 miles below the surface, and I'm sure you all have had enough geology maybe to understand this, but I'm assuming that people haven't. So uh, what's going on offshore is we have a piece of the Earth's crust, a tectonic plate that is subducting under us. We're on the North American plate here. And so we have this plate offshore, the Juan de Fuca plate. When it gets down to about 60 miles below the surface, it's the right temperature, it's certainly hot enough, and the right re uh, amount of pressure to allow melting to occur. And so that rock is hot, and you also, if you release the pressure, you induce melting. And so the melting occurs, and the magma makes its way to the surface. Then it sort of hangs out here until it can find a way to make it all the way to the surface. And so it builds up what we call a magma chamber. Now as it's doing that, it's changing its composition because it's picking up silica material from the crust of the earth and, and it's getting thicker and more viscous. Okay, that plays a huge role in how it erupts. Okay, think about cooking spaghetti on the stove, okay, you all cook spaghetti. If you boil the water for the pasta, what happens? The water just steams up and, you know, turns into steam and, and no big deal. But you put the spaghetti sauce on the stove and you don't stir it, what happens? It starts spitting at you because it's a thicker liquid and it holds the gas. And so, you know, and that's all what a stratocon volcano does. So think of it as building up gas and building up pressure inside there before you have an eruption. Okay, the magma chambers from Mount St. Helens are fed by that plate offshore, and like I said, that plate is named, we named it the Juan de Fuca plate. 
and um, and that's where it comes from. Now, if we look at the cascades, the whole chain. Did I miss it? I, okay, I missed one. I'm sorry, I went past it too fast. Okay, this subduction is going on offshore for all the way from British Columbia to Northern California, and you can see a whole chain of volcanoes here. Everywhere that that plate is subducting, it, it starts right here at Cape Mendocino, and or at the Mendocino Triple Junction, and then it, it goes all the way up here, and so it's creating all those volcanoes. Okay, the Cascade Range, this modern Cascade Range started about 40 million years ago, and the peaks that you see are built on layers of older volcanoes. So these things have a way of erupting and, and destroying themselves, but as long as there's a magma chamber under there, they're going to keep building. Okay, if we look at uh, the, the history of these, we see Mount Lassen last erupted in uh, 1915, I think it was, 1917, something like that. And before that, it was the most recent eruption. But if you look at all of these, by far, there's one of them that's been way more active. Eleanor. Okay, and that's Mount St. Helens here. So we're going from 4,000 years to today, and you can see that it's had many different eruptions. The, the cone itself was about 40,000 years old, but, the, but it's had all these eruptions in the last 4,000 years. Okay, so it's a young volcano, it's a young cone, and it's built on layers of volcanic material from more ancient volcanoes. So this is a picture I took. The mountain is over in this direction behind you, but this is where that 1980 blast went through and hit the adjacent ridge and took away some of the surface material. So you can see that it's built on layers of older volcanic material. Okay. Okay, so we're going to talk about the big blast. What happened in 1980? It caused several volcanic disasters, and so we're going to look at the at, at the events that lead up to the eruption, and then we'll talk about the disasters. So, in March 1980, earthquakes signaled that the magma was on the move. This was the first indication that this volcano was waking up. As you started getting a series of earthquakes, because as that magma makes its way to the surface, it has to kind of shoulder rock aside, and that causes, you know, that causes uh, some seismic activity. So that got, that got people interested in that this is waking up. But the magma didn't, uh, it, it's gonna find the route to the surface the best as can, it, and so apparently it got directed to the north here, and it starts pushing out, and it starts bulging the north slope. So originally the mountain had this shape here, but as the magma came up, the top part stuck, uh, sunk down and a bulge just developed on the north side of the volcano. Now what happens when you've got a steep slope and you make it too steep for it to hold up? Guess what happens? It fails, okay? And so that's what we've got. We've got an over steepened slope here. And this was all happening in the months leading up to the eruption. Okay, on that morning of May 18th, 1980, we had a larger than usual earthquake. So there had been a series of little earthquakes, but then we had a larger than, than usual earthquake. And it is what took that bulge down. So that bulge came down in a catastrophic landslide the largest landslide in recorded history that we watched, that we witnessed. And so that thing, that, that things comes down now, what, what it's doing, let's go back here. What it's doing here is it's looking for a way to the surface, but it's building up gas. A lot of pressure can't get rid of the gas. And so when the landslide happens, that was like taking the cork off the bottle that you shook up, okay? And so that released they, what, um, that released the eruption. Now, what we had, uh, some, some geologists refer to this as the lateral blast. It did not do what we expected. Most people expect a volcano to erupt and go up into the air. But this was pushing towards the north slope. And when the north slope failed, 
that it just shot straight out of the side. And that was the wild card that many people, many people from the USGS had had a lot of experience in that. Remember, this was 1980. This was 43 years ago. And uh, we, they had a lot of experience with Hawaiian volcanoes, but they didn't have a lot of experience with these kind of volcanoes. And they, they would have never put the cold water tower right there in front of the volcano. They put it right there so you, so you could watch it, but it was like looking down the barrel of a gun. Because, you know, no, most people, David Johnson, I believe, did know, but most people did not know that that was going to shoot straight out. So we refer to that as the lateral blast. Okay, so let's talk about it. And smaller one had occurred earlier in the volcano's history, but in 1980, it was largely unheard of. There had been some recordings of Augustine and some of the volcanoes in Alaska doing it, but most people hadn't heard of it. Most people were expecting that to go straight up. Okay, the extent of the area that was affected was unexpected. They did not expect it to blast a whole area like it did. Okay, so after the whole top part of the mountain was gone, then it established the vertical eruption like we expected to do too. But that, that was about an hour later. Okay, and we've got all these landslide deposits and we'll talk about what happened there. So this is uh, the view, this was the view of the mountain uh, right from John, what is now called Johnston Ridge. The observatory tower was called Coldwater Two Tower and they placed it there so we'd have a bird's eye view of the, what it was watching. Um, and, uh, uh, but of course they didn't expect it to come straight towards it, which is what it did. And so we've now renamed that Johnston Ridge for for the volcanologist David Johnston, who lost his life in the blast. David wasn't even supposed to be working the tower that night. He was actually doing it for Harry Glickin, who had gone down to talk to his advisor in California. And so he knew he knew how dangerous it was, but he, he still stayed there. And um, there were two other young women volcanologists that were going to cat and pitch their tent down there that night and he said no it's really not safe and he told them to leave and um and that was good for them because 8 30 the next morning was the eruption okay so what we're going to do is we're going to let's look at this in a sequence of photographs there was an amazing amount of photography being done at this time so we'll look at the bulge developing. We'll look at the earthquake that, or the landslide that gets set into motion. Not we'll crazy. see the vertical blast, the vertical eruption and the lateral blast being initiated. And then we'll see how the lateral blast, because it's moving 200 miles an hour, it's moving a lot faster than the landslide if it overtakes the landslide and then completely overtakes it. So there's an interesting sequence of events. You know, two horses come out of the gate, okay? One of them is twice as fast as the other, so even though they come out at about the same time, as time goes on, there's a big difference in time, lag time between them. Okay, so here is the picture of, of the morning. Now you can see that most of the snow is melted, okay? Because not only was it May, but uh, it was, uh, it's this heat's off from below. Snow melt. Uh, you can see the top part has already sunk down, and you can see the, the bulge that has developed here. And so this is what it looked like on that morning. Okay, then that earthquake, this, this wasn't related to the magma coming up, this was a different earthquake, that, and it was a little bit stronger and just enough to, to take that over steep and slope and cause it to fail catastrophically. So the whole north side of the mountain starts falling off. Okay, and this is moving about, I don't know, 60, 70 miles an hour. Okay, which is still pretty darn fast, but not as fast as, as the gas coming out. Okay, so this is the landslide. This is the whole north slope of the mountain just tumbling down. Okay, 
and that initiate that takes the cork off the bottle and so here we have the, the vertical eruption a little bit of one is going but most of it's going to shoot out here and this is initiate you can still see the landslide here but now you can see the explosive hot ash and gas okay about a second later these were all taken by gary rosenquist who went <laughs> you know, they're taking like a second apart and he happened to be in just the right place to see it and still be safe. And so here is the lateral blast is overtaking the landslide. You can see the landslide still rolling down the hill, but now, it, and then a second later, it's doing this. Okay, remember it's moving like 200 miles an hour and, it, and it's hot ash and gas. Okay, or hot gas and ash, I guess you could say, but hot. Okay, very hot, will burn everything in its path. Yeah. Uh, you can't breathe it because it's all that volcanic ash, and um, these things are pretty dangerous. Okay, you can also see some uh, bombs, volcanic bombs. This is when a chunk of rock gets broken up and then is tossed out with it. You can, you can kind of see these bombs kind of streaming out here. Okay, about an hour later, it had taken off the whole side of the mountain and then the ash column went up just like you would expect a volcano to do. What mm -hmm. about 12 miles up in the air? Plenty. So, are you impressed with these pictures? <laughs> okay, in all, the 1980 eruption caused the mountain to lose about 400 meters, 401 meters from its summit. So here's where the old summit was and now there's this gaping crater and the whole north side of it is gone and, uh, and you, you can see this amazing amount of devastation in one volcanic eruption. Okay, and this is a photo taken up by courtesy of Charles Hall. Oh, this is amazing. First time I gave this lecture, Charles shared this fantastic photo. Wow. He was on the south side of the mountain. Everything went to the north. Wow. So he's standing there watching it all go away from him, and he got this fantastic shot. It is. And I have six frames. And I have yeah. used, yeah. used yeah. this in, in many wow. lectures. Okay, so Thank this is. So much. Wow. Okay, now, if you were impressed with the size of that, let's take a look at where it fits into the grand scheme <laughs> of our <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think you can see. Which, uh, remember Mount Vesuvius, the one that buried the town of Pompeii, and Mount Pinatuba erupted in 1990, and uh, in the Philippines, and Krakatoa, Tam Tambora, they caused a year without a summer, and this one was a pipsqueak. Now, I mean, you know, you look at those pictures and you go, this was a pretty big event, but it was really small in the grand scheme of things. And then if you really want to be impressed, there would be Yellowstone. Oh my God. I don't want to be anywhere around. <laughs> Maybe on the moon. <laughs> Maybe on the so moon. It, it, you know, again, just to get an idea. Now, I think that it was fantastic eruption to be able to witness, but it really was small compared to what a volcano can do. Oops. Okay, so uh, this is 1991, uh, Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines. By then, we had already had 11 years of experience with an active explosive, this kind of volcano. And so we were able to, the USGS was able to mitigate this one very successfully in the Philippines. And so that's what Mount St. Helens taught us, how to deal with these things. They're really different than the Hawaiian volcanoes. Okay, so uh, I want to show some of the effects of the of the May 18th eruption. I'm going to give you some examples from some other volcanoes. So again, that largest landslide, we, we refer to it as a debris avalanche, the largest one in recorded history. Then we had the blast zone. The lateral blast came out and, and decimated this whole area. And there's there were three zones, and I'm, I'll show you them. And then we'll show the pyroclastic flow. This is when that the lateral blast takes off that hot cloud of ash and gas, flows across the landscape, and we, we refer to it as, a, uh, sometimes it's called an ash flow, but we refer to it as 
a pyroclastic flow. And then there's a lot of ash in the air too, so then that all falls and that creates a hazard as well. And then there's finally, the one that reaches the farthest from the volcano is called the Lahar. And this is a muddy river full of volcanic debris. It's like wet concrete pouring down a river. This is the, the hazard that reaches the farthest away. So let's look at this map and you can see the summit of Mount St. Helens right here. You can see uh, that uh, this area here in yellow is the lateral blast zone. And there's three different zones to it that I'll show you what it looks like. So whether you're close to the volcano or far away, the effects are a little different. But this was the whole area. And here we're looking at a distance of five miles. So we're looking 15 or 20 miles away from the volcano. And it blasted this entire area. Okay, the, the pyroclastic flows are deadly. They are seriously deadly. This is what buried the town of Pompeii. But they only reached, they didn't reach too far away from the volcano, maybe, what, five miles at the most. The landslide came down, that's the striped pattern, came down the north fork of the Tuba River and went as far as about 15 miles. So think of this material from the volcano having enough momentum to travel that far. And then, of course, the Lahars take over the rivers and change the course of the river, change the look of the river, and they're the ones that travel farthest. In fact, uh, it, it went into the Cowlitz River, the North Fork of the Tudor went into the Cowlitz River, and then eventually uh, disrupted shipping in the Columbia River during that time. Had to dredge it. Okay, this is the debris avalanche. This is the landslide deposits. I took this picture hiking around, and you can see just this mounds of material rock here. Look, there's no trees. This was a heavily forested area, and there is no sign of trees. Okay, but these are called hummocks, and these are part of the debris avalanche or the landslide that set off the eruption. Okay, the boulders are strewn around uh, and the debris avalanche advanced, well, I'm saying here, 13, 13, 14 miles down the Tudor River. Build the valley up 150 feet higher than it was. So that's a lot of material. That's the whole side of the mountain coming down. Okay, after seeing these hummocks from Mount St. Helens, we can now recognize these ones, which geologists always puzzle over. If you're going down I-5 and you're going past Mount Shatsa, you see all these hummocks and people always wondered what they were. But after we saw what happened in Mount St. Helens, now we understand that these are from Mount Shasta. So we recognize these as what they are, the landslide deposits, basically. Okay, the lateral blast. Here's the, here's the volcano, the, the um, peak itself, but this whole area was decimated into three different zones. So we had closest to the volcano, we had the uh, direct blast zone, and you can see Spirit Lake here. We'll talk a little bit about what happens with Spirit Lake. Then, out, then just outside of it, we have what they call uh, the channelized blast zone, and then the very fringes of this is called the seared zone. And each one of them affects the forest a little differently, and that's where it gets its name. So if we look at the direct blast zone, nothing is standing. This mm -hmm. was heavily forested, and there is zilch there. Human helicopter. That's what it looks like. The trees were completely sheared off, pulverized, become part of this horrible flow of hot ash and gas and everything mixed in. And this is all that's left of it. This was mature forest, warehouse or cover forest. Okay, now in the channelized blast zone, there was enough power to blow down all the trees, but it didn't pulverize them. You know, so this was around the fringes of the direct blast zone. I know that looks like grass made down. Those are mature trees. <laughs> okay, warehouser did have a lot of work after that, trying to salvage as much of that timber as they could. Um, it, it, so those were trees that were just blown down by the, just the sheer force of the gas. 
Okay, and so if we look a little closer, you can see here's the size People. of the workers. Here's what we're looking at there. It looked like grass in the other picture, right? But it's 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 mature trees. So here you can see the size of the workers. Super and that, even the log trucks were no match for this. Now, in range. this zone, on the very fringes, is what we call the seared zone. So the trees were burned, they, but they're still standing, okay, the dead standing zone. And, uh, and then I took this picture about uh, 10 years, or at least 10 years later, more like 20 years later. And so they have replanted, so all the green that you see in here now has been replanted right now. since then. Okay, Not there or come up right. since then. So this is where Gary Rosenfeld was standing in this area here oh. when he took those famous pictures that have been, now been animated and become, you know, an icon for the eruption. Okay, so, uh, but, and then look at what, beyond it, untouched forest. So we've got this, you know, dead standing trees and beyond it, and that's, this is right where Gary Rosenfeld took his pictures. He was right on the edge. And uh, you, know, you can see the interface between the living trees and the dead standing, and he was right there at the edge. You could see all the ash on the ground, too. Okay, did it create a tsunami? I'm using this word loosely to mean a big splash of water, <laughs> okay? Because so I'm not a tsunami, but a big... Spirit Lake was the site of this. So Spirit Lake, you saw, was to the north of the mountain, and it was America's playground. And then what happened? Well, the eruption happened, and uh, and we've got, uh, let's look at it a little closer. Let's look at that hill a little closer. And if you look really close, you can see little tiny trees standing here up to about 200 feet elevation above the lake level. So there's, there's all these dead standing trees. You can still see them 40 years later when I was doing a helicopter tour. So they're still up there laying down there. And, uh, but the landslide happened first, but the trees were already blown down. So the landslide happens and it plops into the lake, but the trees were already down, okay? It splashes the water up to 200 feet above the lake level and then washes all those trees into it. So the lake is sitting here turning into petrified wood. We're actually watching how wood gets in a, in a silica-rich lake. So this is logs floating around here. So what was that sequence of events that happened? The landslide happened first, and yet by the time the landslide cut to the lake, the it's trees were already okay, guys. The sound okay. okay. The landslide happened first, but it's moving only, you know, the, the lateral blast is moving at more than twice as fast. So the left, you know, the landslide starts, Lateral blast goes through, knocks down all the trees, then the landslide makes it to the lake, splashes it up, the trees are already down, and then they get washed into Spirit Lake. You can still see this 40 years later. I was leading helicopter tours, and you can still see this whole sequence of events. Here, if you look a little closer, now you can see those trees laying down. Can you see the leftover trees from 43 years ago? And then all of this debris in the water is floating logs. This is what they didn't want to salvage. They salvaged as much as they could. But to prevent wildfires. Okay, and this is uh, a picture I took of Spirit Lake from the air, from the helicopter. And you can see that's this ridge that we were looking at here. And you can see all this white stuff in the water. That's logs laying in the water. They're turning into petrified wood. Where is Harry Truman's place? What? Where is Harry Truman's place? I'm sorry. Where is Harry Truman's place? Oh, uh, underneath about 150 <laughs> feet of materials. Mm. Uh, the lake is about 200 feet higher than it was. Oh, like no, big. You know, because so much stuff went into it. Yeah. He would have been at this end. So What's that? He would have been at this end. But yeah, at our end. Right, right, yeah. 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 Yeah, we're, looking, we're looking north to Mount uh, Rainier. The Rainier. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about permaplastic flows here for a minute. 
The, these, this is what happens when, okay, so a lateral blast happens and the, and the ashes, the gas is driving the ash. And uh, when it gets too heavy to go up into the air, it starts rolling down the side of the hill. And so, uh, you know, it depends on the ratio of, of ash to gas. And when there's a little more ash, then that gas can propel into the air, it's just gonna roll down the side of the mountain. And it's going about 200 miles an hour. So this is a picture taken from Mount Unzen in Japan, 1991. And uh, a lot of uh, volcanologists were here photographing this thing. This cloud is moving right towards the camera. Okay, this is one that was taken from the north slope of Mount St. Helens, right before it caught that trailer. I hope the people were out of the trailer. I don't know the story to that at this one. But it, it's gone. You know? And uh, a lot of times it was silent and the people didn't even hear it because the sound went up and over. And then all of a sudden, you know, they, you hear the trees crackling, but you didn't hear any blast. It, it, it was incredible. Now, in 1902, we learned about mm. these things, these powder plastic flows, when um, the, the town of Saint Pierre in the Caribbean was uh, was attacked by a pyroclastic flow that came off of Mont Pelé, and and, and uh, we can see it here. So this is what this is the town after it was rebuilt, but this is what mm. it would have looked like in 1902 before the pyroclastic flow hit it. As soon as the pyroclastic flow hit it, that's what it looked like. Okay. It burns everything in its path. Concave of the west. Okay, and then these explosion craters are on the north slope of Mount St. Helens in the devastated zone, and that's what they, they are. They're, they've got water in there now, but basically you have hot material under there contacting the groundwater and causing these little secondary explosions. Freeze. So we had a bunch of those as well. In, in the area that we now call the pumice plant, Okay, the ash, where did it go? It went, primarily went to the east because that's the wind direction. Prevailing wind direction at this latitude, it comes off the Pacific Ocean and blows eastward. And so most of the ash, it went all the way over to Minnesota, the very edge of it, but you can see it was really severe right here. I went up and gave a talk in Brentsville uh, last year about this because they were right here and they just got totally blasted with ash. Okay, um, I will say that uh, I lived in Southern Oregon at the time and I got a dusting of ash on my car and I lived way out in the boonies. And uh, so this, this isn't exactly accurate, the ash went all over. People here in Portland told me that you had quite a bit of ash too. So that probably was the fifth eruption, I think. Yeah, that south. might have been a, a, a yeah, later correct. eruption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we got it here. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, I think you're right about that. Now let's look at what this ash is. It is an ash from the fireplace. It isn't wood, combusted wood. It's made of little tiny shards of, of volcanic glass. Because when you take lava and you cool it immediately, it doesn't form rock, it forms volcanic glass. And so this stuff is pulverized, and if you look at it under the microscope, it's just, it's like little shards of fiberglass. Mm -hmm. This is why you don't want to be breathing it. This mm -hmm. is pretty, you know, if you've ever done insulation work on a house, you know that you don't want to be breathing that fiberglass, and that's just what this stuff is. Okay, and then this is on the way to Ritzville, and this is what it looked like, the sky looked like. People who were driving in their cars, they stopped. What's going on? And um, mm -hmm. you know, and you can see the ash already falling. So this is several miles away, and it just blackened the sky. I had relatives that lived in Yakima, and they said the sky got pitch black in the middle of the day. Okay, and they just got dumped on by the ash. Okay, so it blankets eastern Washington. It blankets the area. Okay, it creates problems for homeowners. You don't want that on your roof because it's heavy. <laughs> okay, it's rock. It's a material like rock. And, uh, and it will collapse roofs. And road crews didn't even know what to do with it. They, they were shoveling it out of the way. They, uh, they built a town, let's see, 
they tamped it all down and built houses on it. Oh in, no. Uh, I can't remember what town that is right now, just down the Tudor River. And uh, yeah, so they didn't know what to do with it. They just had mountains of this stuff. Okay, so but now uh, let's look at the disaster that reaches the farthest away, and that is called the Lahar. This is an Indonesian term that means a big flow of uh, ash and water flowing down a river, a volcanic mud flow, we refer to it. Okay, so uh, they form when you get all this uh, volcanic ash, and then you melt all the snow at once. So you get, you know, a rush of water, and it's filled with ash, and it just rushes, flows down the, the Tudor River. Uh, in this case, it went down all of the rivers, but it went the farthest down the north fork of the Tudor River. Okay, this takes houses right off the foundation, takes out bridges, and just completely changes the, the landscape. Okay, you can see by, here's the Muddy River, so that's south of the volcano, I believe, and this is what, the, the, any, any river that's strong enough to move a rock that big has an incredible carrying capacity. Okay. And that's, that's what we judge the strength of the river by the biggest piece of rock that it can move, and that could get size there. You can see the ash all over the place as this came went through, deposited the stone, and then went on beyond, but it totally changed the landscape. And, okay, we learned about these mm -hmm. things in 1985 when in, in uh, Colombia, there was a little town and uh, the, a mountain, and this is uh, the town of Armero, about 25,000 people lived here. The, the volcano it is uh, named Nevado del Ruiz, and it is a little volcano just up this canyon here. It had a small eruption, but enough to set off a lahar. They came scouring down here. They didn't warn the people in time. They didn't, there was some, political things going on. No, we don't want to bother people and so forth. And, you know, by the time they got word, it was too late and the entire town was buried. So this was a disaster that we vowed to ourselves with. we would never let this happen again. It was preventable. The deaths that occurred were preventable. People were just, it was terrible. People were just surrounded in this. They couldn't get out of it. <coughs> And a lot of them just died in place because they were just, you know, pretty, pretty nasty stuff. Okay, if we look at the Lahar deposits, we can tell where they went in the past. We can predict where they're going to go in the future. And so geologists are very interested in Lahar deposits. They look like this. Volcanic ash, and you've got big rocks embedded in it. Okay, so this is one of the good indicators of where the future disasters will be. <clears throat> okay, this is what the North Fork of the Tudor River looked like before the eruption. A beautiful, tranquil river, people fishing. <laughs> this looks like a typical river in the Pacific Northwest. Okay, this is what it looks like now. Completely changed the, the whole, uh, at, you know, complexion of the river. We change it. You can see the ash everywhere. You can see, you know, the river kind of makes its way through all this ash. It's it's up much higher, about 100 feet higher than it used to be, and, and so forth. Yeah. Has the ash hardened by now? Huh? Has the ash hardened by now? Did it harden? Yeah. Yes, it does. Yeah. So it comes out, especially it comes out wet, but then after a while it sits and dries and solidifies. Yes. And so here it is, but you can see the modern rivers kind of making its way through all the ash, but completely different. It changed, it filled the whole valley and changed the whole landscape. Okay, what's happened since, uh, question. Where did, where did all the water come to dry the lahar that big? What's it? What's where did the water come from that the, It the, comes from, well, the river, you know, it's a river to begin with. It takes over the pre-existing river, but you get extra, uh, you know, you've got a lot of snow on the mountain and then it's been melting Glacier. because the magma is coming up and heating up the <coughs> mountain. So you get all that snow melt with, mixed with all that ash at the same time. 
that melted all the glaciers. And it melted all glaciers. the glaciers, yeah. So that's a lot of ice, and then that all gets melted at once, and it all comes rushing down the river. Okay, uh, okay, so let's look at what it looks like today. So you can see the north slope here is all gone. It's just this huge ramp now. And this, it, remember the volcano, the peak of the volcano was way up here. That's all gone. That's all kind of came down. And now you can see new activity right in the crater. There's still lava under there. There's still stuff coming up. Okay, it's still active. And so it's developed a horseshoe-shaped glacier around that hot dome of rock. And that's what it's got now. Okay, so since the 1980 eruption, it's been rebuilding itself because that's what volcanoes do. They have, you know, they build themselves up and build themselves up, then they have a catastrophic eruption that tears it down. But there's, as long as it's still being fed by magma below the surface, then that is coming up to the surface, forming lava domes and so forth. And so the lava domes are still growing. It's building itself up. Okay, it's expected, so throughout the 1980s, we started watching, this is right inside the crater now, uh, and that there's now a glacier all the way around it, but you can see this hot material still in the center there, and it's adding, you know, 17 million, uh, million cubic yards of lava per year. So they're mapping this, what happened then, and what happened then, and I'll show you some pictures of it. Okay, it's kind of interesting, after a period of quiet time, remember this happened in 1980, so in late 2004, uh, this was still going on, and so somehow the news media got a hold of it and said, oh, Mount Sydney Holmes is, is, uh, is active again, and, and people started getting worried about it. Uh, I, I lived in Yamhill and, and I taught at the high school there. So the superintendent told me that he hated geology. He confessed that to me. And thought, okay. And so he didn't know how, because he didn't like geology and didn't pay attention, he heard that there was activity in there. So he closes the school. <laughs> he the school Yamhill, and people are going, where's Yamhill? It must be really close to the volcano. I said, no, no. It just, we just have a superintendent who didn't understand what's going on. Okay. Uh, so he kind of jumped the gun there, you know, kind of put his foot in his mouth. A good guy, I liked him, but you know, he, he didn't know his geology. Okay, so what this is doing is having small eruptions, but they're contained within the crater. These aren't really anything to be worried about at this point. Okay, they've mapped it all out. So if you look at it here, you can see different bumps. This is all inside the crater here. And you can see Mount Rainier in the distance to the north here. And you can see that they've actually mapped out what years, 2005, most of these, you know, each lobe of this, they're, they're mapping it out and keeping it uh, going. And this is a picture I took from the helicopter uh, before COVID shut us down. <laughs> Okay, so you can still see now, you know, very active. This is inside the crater here, and you can see, you know, and, and there is a glacier developing around the outside of it, but mostly this is still, you know, still warm enough to be some activity, nothing to be worried about the public. Okay, so now what? Okay, if it continues at the present rate that it has been, they figure in 200 years it will be back up to where it was before 1980. Wow. And that's the idea here. Will another big eruption happen? I don't think so. I don't think right away. I think it's, it's in the dome building stage. It's, it's all contained within the crater. And yes, there is lava erupting, but it's, you know, it's not, there's nothing plugging it hard enough to trap the gas to get it to very explosive. In my estimation, I could be wrong. Okay. Uh, eventually, though, given the past history of it, it will eventually build itself up and plug itself up enough that we will have another catastrophic eruption. That's what they You saw what it did over the last 4,000 years. So it's definitely going to happen again, but I don't think we have to worry about it anytime soon. Okay, we can't predict with uh, certainty when that'll happen, so what's our best defense? 
continuous monitoring. And we have several different modes of monitoring volcanoes. Earthquakes are very uh, effective there, but we have other ways of monitoring it too. And so this is why we have the USGS and this is why they have a station up there in uh, Vancouver uh, to keep an eye on it. And they're, they're, they're charged with keeping an eye on all of our active volcanoes in the U.S. And even uh, they have a team of scientists that goes around the world and helps other countries mitigate volcanic disasters. So uh, today with active steam vents showing up, you can still see that it's hot in there. Okay. It's, it's, it is developing a glacier, but you can see the steam coming out. So there's still, you know, there's still heat in there. There's still hot rock in there. So we got to remember that all of our neighboring volcanoes are active. These kind of stratocone volcanoes, not all of them, but most, a lot of them are. Okay, Mount Rainier is considered the most, one of the most dangerous. Why? Because it has a history of these volcanic mud flows, the lahars that come down, and there's a lot of people living at the foot of this thing and right in a dangerous way. That's something we've got to think about where you build your town. Okay? We want to build it on a nice flat area. Guess what made it nice and flat? No. Okay, you've got, got to think about that. Okay, Mount Hood, of course, it, as you know, is right in the background of Portland. And Three Sisters are pretty active. Look at that nice lava mm -hmm. flow in the foreground. So South Sister was swelling, what year was that? I think 2005 or something like that. South Sister started swelling, and we were concerned about it. Okay, all the hills in the Portland area are volcanoes, but they're not stratocone volcanoes. These are little cinder cones, we call this the boring volcanoes. You can see Mount um, Hood in the background, but, but uh, Portland is one of the only cities in the U.S. that's built in a volcanic field. These are volcanoes, what? Mount Tabor, Mount Scott, and so forth. Okay, so Mount St. Helens brought so many new advances to volcanology that we now use, uh, we apply them around the world to help people be safe from volcanic hazards. Okay, so I'll end with that there. Thank you very much. I, I uh, was city manager during one of these explosions, and when I went home, uh, there was ash all over the bumper of the pickup, which I collected. He reminded me that there were more um, ash things that came to the, yeah, to the area. Yeah, there was. I remember it was active in Ithaca in 2004, mm -hmm. you know, and enough, you know, enough that it caused some concern, but it wasn't going to have a large scale eruption yeah. like 1980. It, it seemed like it was shortly after 1980. There were five to six other eruptions. Right after. And they, I think it was the fifth, fourth, or fifth that made it to Portland. All the rest of them went. Yeah, yeah. Right. and uh, let's see. I remember <laughs> hearing about somebody, I'm, I'm reaching back in my memory, which is getting bad. Uh, somebody in, the, in this area here, or a little bit south of here in the Willamette Valley, got their farm equipment was destroyed by, by ash. You know, and that was in one of those subsequent that was that one eruption mm -hmm. one south. Yeah, yeah. So I, I remember it covering the whole downtown area as far I lived on Avery Street, which is south of town. Yeah. And it was that yeah. deep. And people were bringing me ash. I had, let's see, 19, what year would it have been? Still I came up here in 1985. It was 1980. Well, it was that same year. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that was that same yeah. year. I was still in Southern Oregon. So, okay, yeah. Uh, you know, you mentioned 12 mile high, the 12 mile high yeah. dome. Yeah. Three of us were swimming in Lake Oswego and we could see it. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was the most amazing thing because there were a lot of hills in the lake. Were you scared? No, just fa fascinated. Yeah, <laughs> because it wasn't really right over. Yeah, yeah. right. And yeah. my husband and my youngest son were on their way to Longview. Yeah, uh, which I was a little worried about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you noticed uh, Mount Hood, please. Yeah. 
mountains and hills had a lot of uh, eruptions. How do you how do you calculate when an eruption occurs? Uh, how do you calculate which eruption? Past eruptions. What past, past eruptions? Oh, uh, by the each one has its own signature and the type of ash. We can pick up volcanic ash anywhere and trace it to the uh, to the volcano that it came from. And so they and they also map out the layers and, and, and get get relative dating from it. But then they can get, they can get uh, radiometric dating from it and get the age of the ash too. And I, I think it's amazing because each each ash each volcano has its own signature, and you could trace the ash to a particular volcano even, which is amazing. Yeah. Uh, early early you mentioned the. Uh, Three volcanoes in the Portland Hills. Yeah. Could those be due to erupts anytime soon, or those probably are not going to. Those are more like cinder cones. They're not stratocone volcanoes. Mount Hood is the big stratocone. They're small activity. We think uh, with it, I'm not really sure of the origin of it. Are, are you uh, familiar with the, what the latest? I think because yeah, we have one of the master students, uh, Darlene, is working on Yeah, Darlene team. Gilroy, uh, or used so. to be Gilroy, yes, yeah, right. she's working. So we do have students working on it, trying to figure out why exactly are these here, and will they erupt again? We don't expect anything anytime soon, but we do know how to watch these things, and we can get people out of the way if need be. You know, and that's the main, that the main thing is keeping the monitoring. And you had a, somebody in your a question? Yeah. No, I was just going to comment. I climbed St. Helens in 1951. Wow. It went over what they called the lizard route to the Zongas. And uh, the glaciers were really quite thick. And you had to watch where you were going to close the crevasses. And, and that was 1951? Yeah. Wow. So that was a good climb because. Well, yeah, well, I mean, it was taller than it is today. And of course, it was a good. Um, and you were younger then, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want a good view of what transpired, um, somebody drive up to Cougar and keep going up to Ladder Canyon. Yeah. And you can walk down Ladder Canyon. Yeah. It's kind of precarious. But it's interesting. Yeah, it, it, there's, you know, they really mapped it out. And, and like I said, it's been the, you saw the chart, it's been so active over the last 4,000 years. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, good. Any other comments or questions? Yeah. You had to blast out, and then there was a blast, there was a blast <laughs> up that took the, between the, the, crater, <coughs> the crater, the back part of the crater. The front part of the crater got blown out this way. But the back part of the crater, did that get out of the... Yeah, the once, once it had relieved enough pressure to shoot out the side, once enough of the top of it, enough of it was gone, then it established the vertical eruption like we expect. But that first shooting out the side, nobody expected that, or very few volcanologists did. David Johnson was one, that, from my understanding, he was aware of the danger he was in, but, yeah. Well, that is exactly what I was about to say, is I think David Johnston must have studied Mount Lassen, because if you go there in Pumas County, California, it had a almost identical side blowout um, eruption. Yeah. It's, a, it's an andesite. 1915, I think that was, right? Right. And then it had a lot of phreatics up through 18. And, and he'd been in Alaska and seen the stratocones in Alaska, and they do, they, mm -hmm. uh, I think it was, um, I can't remember the name of it. Um, Mine, yeah, no yeah, no yeah, yeah, but there was another one too. Um, but anyway, that had mm -hmm. a lateral of laughs, so he and, and the name escapes me right now. Yeah. I yeah. feel like maybe his message of warning to people because he eventually went over the heads of the USGS, made some enemies, said to the media, It's not safe to be here, the radius should be enlarged. And if people had died in the last interruption, maybe they would have taken him seriously. But it was a ranch that got destroyed and everybody got out. But it's the same mountain chain. I think Lassen's part of the Cascades, technically. Yep. Same kind of lava, same kind of situation, just turn of the century. So. Yeah. Now, I do to go on a field trip in July uh, to Mount St. Helens, and it'll be led by the two women that wanted to camp at the base of Oh, wow. Helens. 
And they became volcanologists. You know, they were volcanologists. So, so who are they? Uh, Mindy Grobman and Kat Carolyn Jr. They're going to be meeting, and this is for AWG. And, and I just got to hear it from the horse's mouth. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's, you know. Should we go there? Anyway. Should we sign up for a place where you can go and see the ash in jars or somewhere mm -hmm. that was kept in this area? In this area? I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of You mean here in Portland or yeah. ash was up there? The ash that came this way. Well, I mean, I have jars of it. Yeah. People have plugged in it. All the same. It's all yeah. the same. Yeah. I, I was going to go to look for the ash that I saved, but it depends in other places that, yeah. that people can see what this ash is about, the younger people, and how it felt. Yeah, yeah. I'm not aware of it. Um, uh, Everybody in Portland has, has <laughs> bottles of ash. Everybody who was around in 1980 had seen the ash over there. I have one of those yeah. ridiculous uh, uh, I have a funny story to tell. I was living in Des Moines, Iowa, mm -hmm. and it was 1980. And I had planned to come and move to Oregon because I, I'd been here earlier and, and wanted to go back and live here. And so I'm working away. And I'm still making my plans. I'm saving money so I can come here. And the people are going, oh, you don't want to go there? The volcano is there. I said, tomorrow we're going to have a tornado. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the volcano yeah I, I, I know what you mean. I get all that scared of meteorological disasters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to have to yeah. scoop because I'm oh, also a man of something in Woodbury. Oh, I. I, I just wanted to add that the, of the volcanoes you mentioned today in the slideshow, Nevada del Ruiz is now active. They've just, um, about three weeks ago, called for the complete evacuation of the villages closest to it. Uh, you know, the one where the t whole town and 25,000 people were wiped out. Um, and also, crazy enough, um, the Martinique volcano, uh, Mount Pele, is at uh, elevated activity. Is it acting up? Yes. And the nearby, I think, St. Vincent Island as well, which blew up simultaneously with Martinique in 1901-ish or three, something like that. So this is this is nuts. <laughs> they're, they're out there and they're active, you know. Yeah. And if, if you got to witness it, you got to see something that happens infrequently enough to be kind of special. But they're, you know, but they're erupting all the time. Do you do tel helicopter tours again? Can we go? Mm -hmm. Are you doing the helicopter tours again? Can we go? <laughs> I'm hoping get them back again. Uh, everything kind of shut down with COVID, but I, I'm going to see the people who were hosting it. I got the pilot to go um, where I wanted him to go. And I, you know, I, I worked with the last pilot and I said, Here, you know, here's where I want you to go. And it was, it was good. That's cool. I don't know. I haven't tried it since COVID. So I haven't even tried contacting him yet, but I'm hoping to. It'd be fun to do again. Okay. I, I did it for JSOC and then I just started doing them, you know. Yeah, I'd like to say thank Sh you so should much. we do that, friends? Yes, thank you. Uh, there's a tradition here at Tualatin Heritage Center that uh -huh. you get you get a delicious jar of local strawberry jam. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yay! Shaky cam. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, unfortunately, I'm running another show Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know how it looked good, but friends, we should go on this tour. I think we should. Here's the pro next week. I, I live stream this. Huh? I live stream this, actually. Yeah. Do you want to know where you can see it online? Um, okay, cool. Well, I, I can write down my YouTube info. Oh, I don't know if anybody cares. <laughs> She's like, yeah, you go ahead and put it on. You know, I've done this many times before. You know, permission to put it on the channel. So, yeah. I was hoping to ask her some questions afterward, but she has to go. Oh, I wanted to talk to that gentleman who climbed the mountain and asked if he wants to be interviewed.
friends, I'll be right back with you. I may be filming the ground here for a second. Let me get that for you. Oh, sir, sir. I'm sorry, I don't mean to stalk you. <laughs> I'm gonna film the ground. And I did this as a live stream, and that's fascinating that you climbed the mountain. I'm so impressed. Oh, yeah. um, she was on Mount, Mount Hood the day it erupted. Yeah, the day it erupted, I was climbing Mount Hood. Oh my goodness, you saw I, that. I, I that we were 20 minutes from the summit, and, and the people up above said, Mount St. Helens, we couldn't see St. Helens. Okay. She did it, she erupted. Oh my gosh, and we, wow. and we got up there, and it was going, we didn't hear a sound. I'll oh. never understand that. Okay. Do, do you want to briefly talk about that online um, to the, the viewers, or I would love to interview about uh, okay. interview you about this sometime. Um, you know, we could do that formally if you wanted to, or you know, like you know, this is a, this is a camera on a stick. You know, <laughs> whatever you want to do. Oh, that would be awesome. Okay, so uh, what are your your names? Um, I'm Catherine Davidson. I run a uh, I tried to make a YouTube channel about history, and then the wildfires of 2020 came up. And, um, and so much was going on, I tried to make it more of a, a live stream about uh, giving people evacuation info. But it will be more of a history, let's see, a history oriented thing. And so I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to talk to you guys today. Um, I'm teasing with my wife, Carol, yeah, Dick, Carol Dixon. Dixon. Okay, let me try to zoom out. It's not wanting to. There, perfect. Sorry, say again. Keith. Keith? And Carol Dixon. Nice to meet you Carol. both. And um, what got you into mountain climbing? Well, I wanted to join the Mazamas. Oh yeah, that. I, was, I had that. to climb a, a glaciated peak, and that was it, the first first peak, and that's the day they, they picked. Oh, try to speak up a little bit more. Sorry, <laughs> this. I, I, get... I joined the Mazamas in 1951. Okay. So it's been 70 years, I guess. <laughs> For the people who don't live around here, what are the Mazamas? It's oh. a mountain climbing club. Okay. It was formed about 1996 on the summit of Mount Hood. Such people as uh, Pitrock, the Pitrock, Pitrock Mansion, were part oh, of that yes. group. I've heard of them. They, they, uh, there was like a little, um, uh, like a lookout place with a telephone on the top of Mount Hood. Didn't they uh, help establish summit, that? You know, sign up, you mean yeah. sign up yeah. on the summit? Yeah, yeah. So, and so what were you, uh, what brought you to Mount St. Helens at, at that time when you were climbing up? Well, I've just climbed it because it's part of the requirements of getting uh, what they mm -hmm. call the, the uh, certificate. Okay. They give you, Mazamas will give you a certificate for climbing. Great. So it's like checking off one of the of the lists. So, right, yeah. Did you yeah. get something when you climbed to join? Mm, I guess so. Yeah. Well, I guess so. So you, you climbed Mount St. Helens in 1951, was a bit taller. Yeah, <laughs> so it's less right. of a challenge now then, right? And then you were on Mount Hood when it erupted. Yes. Yeah. Wow. 18. What did it look like? Did you get any pictures or? Well, you know, I, if, if I did, it was just a camera. I, had, I didn't have a cell phone back then. Oh, right. <laughs> I'd have to dig and see if I got pictures. I must have taken my camera up. Right, but yeah. I don't remember. That would be amazing. But we just sat there and ate our lunch while it was erupting. We didn't know when we were up there that it was such a big one. Oh, we goodness. Watched it. And we could see, when we first got up there, we could see Rainier, we could see Adams. Okay. Uh -huh. But then after a bit, we yeah, started our show. Saw you saw you saw then, then we couldn't see, then the ash came oh, and fell, good. and then we couldn't yeah, see yeah, right here, and we couldn't see Adam. Yeah. Oh, wow. People that were climbing yeah. Adams that day, they had trees, tree limbs fall on them, branches. Yeah. Oh, oh, wow. Yeah. I, yeah, I've seen a couple. Yeah, so uh, it didn't come to, no, it did. the ash didn't come on Mount Hood. No, it didn't. Okay. Yeah, I've seen a couple pictures where somebody was up there, and they were doing this, and then it erupts, and then the next photo, they're like flat on the ground, like they had been... You know, oh, okay. just yeah, maybe just overcome and up. with emotions oh, and uh, had to sit yeah. down. Yeah, I knew. A and lot of those those are amazing if you can Google those so, online. Yeah, yeah. But okay. um, let me uh, wrap. Is there anything else you want to say about uh, your experience with the mountain and St. Helens? And well, when we were driving cars, the ash could cause major problems in getting into the motor. So we put mm -hmm. uh, uh, tissue paper or, or toilet paper around the, the toilet filters. Paper. It stops the ash from getting into the system. Well, that's a good trick. Yeah, yeah I've heard pantyhose works. <laughs> Hard on your lungs, too. Oh, goodness. Yeah, you but guys. People would go out jogging. We remember seeing people mm -hmm. out jogging. Right Amazing. Oh. Big clouds of dust in this, in this ash, which is, can be fatal, cause big problems with your lungs. They were still breathing that in and 
running down Barbara Boulevard. Oh, no. Yeah, that's not a good idea. Really not. <laughs> you know, um, all right, I'm going to wrap this up. And, guys, I'll be right back live streaming. Um, thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm going to get their information and talk to some other people, and I'll be live tonight. Thanks for tuning in. So I, I'm stream. new. Yeah, I'm new to this live TV thing. What is live stream? Oh, so this went directly to YouTube.